Good morning, everybody. Um, as always, happy happy Friday, and thanks for thanks for joining us this morning um, for the last uh, presentation of the uh, staff portion of of this this case series. Um, we'll be transitioning over into our phenomenal fellow presentations at the beginning of of next month, um, and I'll, I'll go. Uh, I'll talk about who we're having on at the end after Eugene talks. Um, but for the sake of time, we will get rolling here. So, so I'm super excited and we're super lucky and fortunate to have Dr. Eugene Rowe here um, uh, giving us a presentation uh, this morning. Eugene is a uh, PMNR sports doc. He did his residency out in, um, out in Stanford and then switched coasts to the far, far east coast out in Boston for his fellowship and then went right back to the other coast to where he's at now. He's currently on staff at Stanford, um, at Stanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. He's also the director of musculoskeletal um, and sports ultrasound. So again, I'm super excited to have him. Um, really, really brilliant guy, great ultrasonographer. So looking forward to this. And uh, Eugene, I'll let you take over. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me for the AMSSM uh, case presentation. So let me share my screen. Do you see that now or not yet? Not yet. All right, let me work on it first. Uh, how about now? Can you see that? Perfect. Yep, perfect. Okay, good. So, so I'll get started. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time. Share with me early Friday morning. So this is a good start for me as a, one of the high achievers in 2022. So, uh, so, so I, I appreciate my opportunity. Uh, I'll follow the usual protocol the agenda. So review brief, uh, review my case briefly, and then uh, scanning uh, protocols and some images and some structures for differential diagnosis, uh, also other pathologies, and going back to our case and discuss the ultrasound report to finding a usual format. So my case is a 36-year-old female, delivered a baby five months ago, uh, and she practiced yoga, uh, try to get back to its shape. Uh, uh, two months ago, she noticed uh, some pain in the right, right radial wrist and, but there was no burning, uh, no sharp pain. Uh, pain was worse. Uh, sorry, pain was sharp, and the pain became worse when she moved her wrist uh, all, with all the deviation. And on physical exam, uh, pain is located in just distal to styloid, uh, radial styloid. And the Finkelstein test was positive, and there was no other neural deficit. She so probably has diagnosis already uh, based on this. Um, so uh, in terms of a scanning uh, technique, at first, I think we need to choose a right uh, transducer. I prefer a hockey stick, uh, but my transducer goes up to 18 megahertz. If you have an ultra high frequency, that probably even better, but most of us may not have that option. Or if you only have a linear transducer, I prefer to choose a short width so because of a contour of the wrist and you have to go up and down following the least tubercle and other structures, uh, if you have a really wide transducer, you lose, a, uh, you waste a lot of screen because a, a transducer can only see only uh, half of a, a full width. So stabilization is also quite important, I would say. Uh, as you see in this picture, uh, often I use the other hand, uh, like left index finger, just stabilize the a toe. The transducer itself is a pretty uh, light to hold, but we're dealing with the delicate structures as well. So if you tilt a few degrees, a few millimeters, you, you might miss the target structure. So on the right, uh, with my right hand, uh, I rather have uh, my uh, middle finger and uh, ring finger spread out like a tripod. But in this case, I have a towel right under the patient wrist to make the wrist and styloid uh, forearm really flat so I can move a transducer uh, easier. Uh, and then I anchor my uh, middle finger and the ring finger right on the uh, towel. So it doesn't really move and stabilize really well. So when you, uh, you're probably familiar with this picture, this is a picture from ESSR uh, wrist book chapter 
uh, you'll see the six compartment of the wrist. Uh, you can see that uh, home base is, our home base is least tubercle right here. From that point, you'll see the EPL and more uh, EIP for index, uh, EDC for middle and ring finger, uh, EDQ or EDM uh, for the uh, pinky and go uh, over ulnar, you'll see ECU, not FCU there. So going back to the home base, Lister's tubercle, go to uh, second compartment with ECRL and ECRB. And if you go more lateral or radial uh, aspect, you will see the first compartment as our target structures, APL and EPB. Uh, and when you place a transducer, I just mark it as yellow. So try to keep your transducer perpendicular to the bone. The goal is a perpendicular to the tendon. But if you think just put a transducer right on and you can see the tendon as well. So when you see the second compartment, you may wanna just tilt it together, following the surface together. So uh, the bony surface and transduce, transduce itself is a uh, parallel. So the sound wave, the beam goes perpendicular to the bony structures. And the first compartment, you have to go all the way down. So if you see your hand, uh, it's pretty easy to find that. Uh, you can see EDCs uh, uh, and EIP and go more to the thumb. The first big tendon you can see really easy would be EPL. You can see right there. And next to that, you'll see the snuff box just underneath. And go further, you'll see uh, EPB as well. Uh, from this angle, APL is a little bit hard to see. So to see the APL better, usually I turn the hand uh, in the lateral position, and then uh, EPL, uh, snuff box, and the EPB and the APL, you can see almost the border and the vola aspect uh, to the dorsal aspect. So you can see the APL better from this angle. So I'll show the video of the scanning technique. Uh, I'll start from pronation, pronated position of my hand on the left. As I move forward, uh, I'll turn my hand to the more lateral or uh, halfway uh, supination uh, position. All right, so let's see if that works. I hope it if you don't see the video, let me know. I think you can see that. So now we passed the Lister's tubercle. My uh, transducer is right uh, on the tubercle, going more toward the second compartment right there, uh, passing another bony structure. I saw the small nerve structure just cross the screen just now. And now in, at the first compartment, uh, I rotate a patient hand. So I'm scanning from this angle so you can see better. Uh, from this point, I'm trying to move my transducer a little bit distal uh, to see the split of first compartment tendons better. So now I see uh, EPB and also uh, APL. I see the other structures. And this is a radial branch of a radial artery just crossing under the uh, first compartment. So the first part we'll see. So within, within the tunnel, uh, tendons were identified as a echogenic fibular anatomic uh, structures resting on the radial cortex and appearing as a multiple parallel lines on the longitudinal images and the multiple dot-like echoes on transverse images that you're seeing right now. So you can see the, uh, the bony lesion here, bony line here really bright. So uh, your transducer is a parallel to this uh, bony structures. You can see the tendon vest, and you can see the dot-like structures here uh, and then sitting together. And you see the other blood vessels. Uh, in this picture, you cannot see the nerve, but you may see the uh, other nerves as well. So that's ideal, very simple structure. Uh, how, but there, there is a variant as well. So up to from a 25 to 75 percent of a cadaver dissections, there are several studies done to see the variant. Uh, there are septum between the APL and EPB. So I call it a variant, but it's a quite common. It's almost a known to see uh, some complete or uh, partial uh, uh, septum, and a com a complete is more common, and partial is. Uh, I believe it's about 10% is a lower, much lower number, but most of them are complete 
uh, septum you might see there. Uh, in the ultrasound, uh, you'll see the osseous ridge and you'll see the double bony group one and two to hold the APL and EPB. And uh, you might you see the, hope you can see this line. Uh, there's a high paracrate line on top of osseous ridge. Uh, that is a septum that you'll see. And if you tilt your transducer a little bit, you will lose this angle and just look uh, a hypo or anacrate lesion. So it would confuse you uh, if that is just a uh, swelling or just a septum. So there are other studies to assess the accuracy of ultrasound in detecting uh, uh, anatomic variations by using a 40 cadaveric forearms. And uh, uh, they tested in different ways. Uh, in conclusion, they recommended to use an osseous ridge and double bony group to detect the septum. Uh, overall, septum is not hard to find, but if you see osseous ridge and double bony group, uh, authors uh, mentioned that uh, they're always uh, a uh, hundred percent chance that you will see the septum there. So you can use those uh, easy to find the structures as a surrogate uh, findings to detect the septum as well. So it's somewhat similar to uh, shoulder in the greater porosity. If you see the subchondral lesion, there's a good chance to see the articular surface tear. So it's somewhat similar to that. So going back to the uh, picture from our patient, uh, in an ideal situation, there is a, a osseous ridge, which is not as sharp as the sample picture that I showed you, but there is a, a little nice smooth ridge here, a uh, bony group here and here, and the tendon sitting right here, and then there are another tendon, the APL sitting there. And if you see carefully, there is a, a hyperacoic triangular shaped uh, structure sitting there, that is a septum. So make things even more uh, interesting. Uh, uh, there are multiple slips. So there are uh, EPBs, 95% or probably higher chances that only single uh, fiber, uh, single tendon goes through. Uh, and then there's septum, but APL, they tend to have a uh, multiple slips. Uh, it's a little bit hard to find uh, when it, uh, ultrasound is good at detecting multiple slips itself. But when you're counting the numbers of the slips, it's more challenging. Uh, in terms of a clinical significance, uh, sometimes it confuses you as a uh, small tear uh, in the tendon. And also the surgeons that get the uh, request from the uh, hand surgeon uh, uh, once in a while to see if there is any uh, multiple slips, if I can detect, or uh, they want to plan with the interposition and arthroplasty or tendon uh, translocation in chronic uh, subluxation of a, a couple, a couple metal couple joint uh, patient. So they were to know if what resources they have for their surgery to or harvest some tissues and I can help them uh, while they are planning it. So uh, other than that, the other structures, the uh, normal structures sit around uh, first compartment is uh, superficial radial nerve uh, the, by moving the transducer more from proximal to distal location. Uh, you may see the nerve is just a crossing uh, on top of a, a first compartment. Uh, and then in the video that I introduced in the beginning, I uh, showed well. And also the vascular structure is sitting around. So there's a, a branch of a radial artery. You may see the uh, vein and there's another vein, the cephalic vein, uh, you might see that. So as you move, you move your transducer more distally, uh, more distal level, uh, the artery is located so right underneath. Um, it's rare, but sometimes you can have, pa patient can have a small blood clot there. Uh, had a case with the vasculitis, uh, patient had some wrist pain, but tendon itself didn't look uh, bad. So, uh, we did a Doppler study, the vascular, and they detected other issues. And then uh, the vascular structure is not the common cause of a wrist pain in this area, but uh, there's one differential you can have in your mind when you detect and uh, real pathology. So if there is anything happen with the uh, superficial radial nerve, uh, you, you will see 
the change of the structure. So script, uh, picture on the left is a normal. Uh, you can see a small, but you can see a small fascicle there. Uh, if you have uh, some injury to or neuropathy there, you'll see the fusiform hyperechoic thickening of the nerve uh, with loss of a vascular echo texture. I just included that word. So uh, when you generate your report, you may want to use that words uh, to describe the lesion. And in this case, a patient had an IV placed at, at the wrist and had a pain and blood vessel was nicked and then had a pain uh, later on. So ultrasound was done and visualized uh, some changes in the superficial uh, radial nerve. So intersection syndrome, uh, which uh, is common, uh, less common than the veins, but you can see that in this picture on the bone, uh, styloid, the bottom part here is second compartment. The first uh, compartment is sitting on top of that. So while you're moving your transducer uh, distal forearm, so it's still proximal to styloid, toward the styloid all, all the way down, you will see the um, uh, first compartment uh, sitting on top of the second compartment go more toward the thumb side. Uh, that's normal structure that you will see there. But if there's a, a normal findings, you'll, uh, you can detect a tenos, uh, synovial effusion in the streets of an extensive copy radialis longus et brevis, uh, usually two centimeter proximal to styloid. Uh, and also the loss of a hyper, hyperacric fat plane uh, intervening between these two tendon groups. So well, those are the findings, you will see that. And going back to our case, uh, we can see the bone here. We can see the two tendons. There's a bit of high poetic lesion uh, surrounding the EPB. And uh, as I mentioned, our patient also had a septum. In this picture, the septum, uh, it, it is an isotropic, so I cannot see septum as a hyperechoic lesion. But at the same time, we'll see a hypoechoic lesion or an echoic lesion just surrounding the EPB more. Uh, and that, that shows a swelling of a tendon sheets. So it's consistent with uh, tenosynovitis and affecting uh, a sub, sorry, the EPB uh, sub uh, structures or sub compartments. So you can uh, see that. Because if you have septum itself on isotropy, you may not see the an echoic or hyperechoic in the opposite side of the septum. And in this picture, I compare uh, side to side. If I really detect a difference or just a physiologic uh, changes depending on the patient. So screen left is uh, affected side. You can see the uh, hyperechoic lesion. Uh, the asymptomatic side, uh, there is no changes here. So you can see the difference between affected side and the unaffected side. So uh, until you really become familiar with these findings, uh, you can use your right hand uh, unaffected side first. So you get the, you know, some basic, uh, some ideas what normal should look like uh, and the less pressure. Because as long as you put the transducer on the affected side, patients start asking the question, what's going on? What do you, what do you see there? So you buy more time, you get an idea of what's really going on there. And as I move transducer a little bit lower, uh, I see the uh, radial artery branch sitting there, but also uh, there is still uh, EPB, there is a, a hyperechoic lesion and uh, edema just surrounding uh, EPB. It just confirms the uh, pathology again. And I, I Use a Doppler as well, not quite commonly uh, used to detect a hyperemia. I don't use a hyperemia, really see the clinical improvement that much in this area, but you can use a Doppler, uh, see other structures, uh, if there's any significant hyperemia around the uh, tenosynovitis as well. Okay, I think, uh, uh, I'm just putting uh, those images together as a video clip. So moving the transducer patient hand is a lateral position. Uh, starting from styloid, you can see the split and now it's going even more distal. At the level I can see artery, you can see a quite a good amount of swelling uh, surrounding an EPB in this video. 
Okay. All right, the last part, uh, I'll say uh, in, in terms of a treatment, uh, I'll just uh, discuss the treatment a little bit. Uh, the septum, uh, we discussed the septum, is quite common to see the septum. So it becomes a more important that when you make a plan for the treatment, uh, sometimes the surgeons uh, want to treat only one, one side to release rather than they release the both side. So they do the only uh, EPB side to release, make a, a area of the surgery really small. And when you do the injection, you may you want to make sure you're injecting uh, the steroid into the correct side or uh, both side if indicated. Uh, the common cause of uh, injection failure by landmark guidance uh, is you're injecting only one side. So back then, the uh, they literature, they recommended injecting on both sides uh, and also proximal distal, make sure you cover everything. Uh, so when you make a plan, uh, understanding septum becomes more important. So the last part is a uh, review of ultrasound report. I just follow the, what others are using, uh, complete diagnostic and the wrist and just some indication, uh, technical aspect. I'll mention the linear uh, transducer or hockey stick. We have uh, multiple devices, uh, ultrasound machines in our practice sharing with other uh, my colleagues. So I uh, try to describe which uh, machine I use. So when I need to go back to the case, I can find it a bit easier. Uh, you know, findings usually compare with uh, previous images or sometimes MRIs. Uh, if you just see the x-ray, I still mentioned that. And the first uh, sentence I mentioned, uh, how I position the patient, probably this line would be more helpful for other sonographer or to myself and give me, uh, that allowed me to understand what position, how I scan it so I can replicate uh, scanning in the future if it's necessary. If you use the other hand for comparison, I, I'll mention that as well. Uh, in the decuvian tenosynovitis, uh, similar to some EMG findings, there was an accurate lesion or hypercrit lesion surrounding APL and EPB, uh, the radial styloid and the scapoid level uh, without hyperemia. And I use a word that is suggestive or consistent with. So if, well, that, that's a cue to myself. If it's a consistent, I see it's more, more confident, more probable and suggestive of is a slightly low. So I have an idea when I need to scan the wrist one more time, uh, repeat the test in the future. Um, and uh, if you don't see other significant problem with the nerve, you can uh, describe it. And the conclusion, you describe a diagnosis usually. And at the bottom part, depends on your preference. Uh, I was recommend to use this word. So you just say uh, correlate with the physical exam and symptoms and consider additional diagnostic workup uh, indicated. That's kind of common close we get from uh, MRI report as well. And uh, I think it'd be a good idea to attach some images. In uh, my institution, the images doesn't go into packs. So the referring providers uh, or orthopedic surgeons most commonly, uh, they don't, uh, they're not familiar with the different paths to find these ultrasound images. And I, so it's much easier to put it in the, our report and they can see the picture well. And also I recommend that when you label it, uh, we use a word that short axis or long axis all the time. But if you can say axial, sagittal, or coronal, the referring provider is more uh, familiar with those uh, orientation uh, labeling. Uh, so it'd be helpful for them to understand the picture uh, as well. Okay, so for take home, uh, the position uh, rotation of a wrist uh, when you scan and stabilization is uh, important. Uh, so consider using as uh, the other hand, uh, even though this transducer is really small, the septum is a really common, uh, or the variant of multiple sleeve in the APL is also quite common. And for the differentials, think about uh, intersection, uh, superficial neuropathy, uh, also CMC arthritis there, uh, rarely there's some blood clot or as a vascular etiology as well as possibility. When you treat that uh, injection or make a surgical plan, uh, just septum, you have to uh, know that when you uh, deliver the medication, make sure you deliver to the affected side uh, aspect or from both APL and EPB. And uh, ultrasound report, uh, uh, just to mention, like, uh, make it easy for the referring provider to understand. So that's 
pretty much it. I have uh, just a few minutes to answer some questions. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks Eugene. That was that was really well done. That was a great, you know, comprehensive overview of this area. So thanks, thanks for going uh, going through that and presenting that case. Um, I have I have one question. I just want to pick your brain on one thing, and then um, I'll make a couple points afterwards. But the one question, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the the potential variations for multiple slips with with a lot of these dorsal wrist tendons, but specifically the APL. Can you just comment on on your technique as to how you differentiate, you know, an APL tear or split tear versus, you know, an accessory slip? I think it's quite challenging. Uh, I, I didn't mention uh, too much in detail. Uh, when you're detecting the small changes, I think a predictive value is only, is only a 50%. There's a pretty high chance that you can miss that. Uh, but the, if I wanted to find it, I uh, try to see the bony groove as well. Uh, some uh, sometimes when there's a slip, you can you can see the uh, groove. If you can see the groove of each uh, slips, if you can see that, that would be helpful. And uh, also, if it's affected side and it's just a multiple slip, uh, they tend to have a multiple slips and bilaterally rather than only one side. So I compare the unaffected side. Uh, and then I see the very similar findings of a, a hypoechoic lesion between the slips, then probably that's a multi part of a multiple slips. If there is a, something really going on and the more tear, uh, there are probably asymmetry in the images. So I use a control lateral images uh, quite often. And sometimes I, I might turn on the Doppler if I detect anything small. Uh, so I try to add a little bit more layers of a, uh, a kind of detection technique to add a more confidence for that. Yeah, perfect. I, yeah, thanks for thanks for uh, for going over that. I agree completely. And <clears throat> you know, with with APL, like you mentioned, I mean, the anatomic variability and variations are are significant. And you know, I've seen people with you know three, four, five different tendon slips. I think in the literature, it's been reported up to six. Um, and they can, you know, they can be all over the place, right? So most commonly, this is going to, you know, insert on the first metacarpal, but they can, they can track down and, and insert, you know, on the trapezium. I've seen some that insert onto, onto the phenar fascia. Um, and, and so it's, it's highly variable uh, with these different slips. And I think what you said, looking for the bony ridges is, is incredibly important comparing side to side. You know, that's, that's why everybody has two sides. So you can compare the other side um, are, are ways to help determine tear versus, um, versus accessory slip. And then, you know, also just following these down and, you know, seeing where they, where they distally insert if there's, if there's, you know, differential insertions, you know, that's very clearly separate slips, um, versus a, a tear. So I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, the two other points that I just wanted to make quickly. So, so my, my protocol is, is fairly similar to yours, you know, as, as most of us do, I'll, you know, start dorsal wrist at Lister's tubercle. I'll go through dorsal wrist um, compartments and look at, look at tendons first. I then tend to, after I finish, you know, a complete evaluation of my tendons, then I'll, for, for, for the dorsal wrist, and I'll do a little bit of a, of a joint um, interrogation and look at DRUJ. I'll look at scaphalunate joint. Um, and then scaphalunate ligament, obviously, and, and then the, the, the nerve vascular structures that you mentioned, I'll do those as well. So, so fairly similar protocol. Um, and then, yeah, you made a great point about this, you know, harping on, you know, this, this intratendinous septum that can differentiate the, the tendons. Um, and with the queer veins, you can have, you know, involvement of both tendons, you can have preferential involvement of the APL versus the EPB. And, and your case was actually great to show that exact point, you know, that only one tendon was involved with, with relative sparing of the, um, of the other tendon. So I think that's a good point to make, um, especially when, when you're considering treatment, which I won't belabor that point because, because you, you made that point um, quite well. So um, that's, that's all that I have. I think, uh, we've got a couple questions here, Eugene. So, um, let's go. Here's one from Barry. So I found it challenging to locate superficial branch of the radial nerve over the first dorsal compartment 
Any recommendations as it's needed to visualize if performing volar to dorsal injection? I see. So uh, locating superficial branch, I think there is a change, uh, a lot of improvement. I'm talking about the ultrasound machine 10 or longer than that. The image quality 10 years ago, what we get, uh, the machine you get these days, uh, I can see things much better. I think there are ultra uh, high frequency, probably we'll get that uh, in a few years. Uh, they're already out there, but it's a high-end machine. So probably in the portable machine or a more usual machine that we probably can see, and it will be much easier at that point. Uh, the, what I use now, if I really need to superficial, I think there I see the small fascicles uh, just around the tendon uh, APL and uh, sometimes patient can tell, like I feel like seeing down to my thumb and that's, yeah, then it's easy. Uh, then if I really want to make sure that's a nerve, I'm not missing the mixing up with the other structures, uh, I usually scan backward. So it's branching out at the supinator, around the supinator, you kind of go with the PIN, go to the superficial radial. If you really want to uh, confirm that that's a nerve, I, I go backward uh, and, uh, while you get used to a superficial radial nerve, like that's another thing you kind of train yourself when you see that something that looks a superficial radial nerve and you scan backward and you know how it uh, moves all the way up, merges up, becomes a proximal portion. That's probably one of the practice you can try, uh, get used to a superficial radial nerve. Um, that, that's that's a how I confirm it. In terms of, I think the next question is placing a needle uh, in plane, short or long axis. So I'll say it is, I place the needle well, more of a short axis uh, to the tendon and still prefer in plane approach. And I want to see the, uh, the pattern of uh, the spread, whether it's circling the, uh, the whether the medication is circling uh, the tendon that I wanted to inject, whether it's leak, leaking out or just making, making a good circle and I have a confidence, I usually turn the transducer to 90 degrees as well, with the long axis view, make sure it follows uh, the outside. So it's a tendon sheath uh, and it's not leaking uh, out to the other structures. That's how I do the uh, injection if I need to. Great. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Those are great questions. All right. Well, if not, um, we will we will call it here again. Uh, Eugene, thanks a lot for, for getting up early and and uh, going you know very very in depth and and uh, and, and covering a you know a fairly complicated area. So appreciate that and 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 great job as always. Great, thank you so much. Have a nice weekend. You too. And for everybody else, so. Um, this is complete um, accident, but we uh, we are scheduled now to have another Stanford talk uh, in in two weeks, um, which uh, which will be great. So as I mentioned, Eugene is is closing out our staff portion of the case series, and we're going to transition over to the fellow portion. Um, so the the Stanford fellows, we've got Ann Kuabara, uh, Cam Fawcett, and Jessica Sow. Um, they will be presenting on February eleventh. Yep, February eleventh. Um, and they're going to be doing a case, uh, a combined case of three of them on, on medial tibial stress syndrome um, and looking at, at some of these bony changes that we see on ultrasound. So that'll be on 2.11. Um, otherwise, everybody have a, have a great weekend. Eugene, get some sleep and uh, everybody stay warm. <laughs> great. Thank you. Bye-bye.